Jiang Chen had never expected this to happen to him. In this post-apocalyptic world, he suddenly found himself tied up in a chair by a beautiful blonde girl. He couldn't help but admire the girl's beauty, but she just angrily cracks a whip in her hand and demands to know his name and where he came from. She makes fun of his girly name and when he tries to talk back, she slams her heel right beside his crotch, terrifying Jiang Chen. When she asks him where he came from, he lies and tells her that he came from the north. Why is she asking this? Well, she brings up and drinks the can of soda that she found on him. All she wants to know is where he found it. Jiang Chen hesitates since he really doesn't know how to explain it, which makes the girl threaten to step on his crotch one more time. The girl points her gun at Jiang Chen's head and threatens to murder him, but Jiang Chen retorts that he saved her life. The girl calms down, realizing that she might be crossing the line, and puts her gun back in her pocket. Jiang Chen tries to explain that he's not truly a bad guy and has no evil intentions. He's just from somewhere more affluent hoping to collect some useful stuff in the city. Moreover, he just saved her earlier from almost starving to death. The girl inquires and asks about what he could want from their destroyed city. All the supermarkets have been cleaned out and one wouldn't even be able to find a slice of bread to eat. Jiang Chen suggests to her that maybe they should work together. He needs a native guide to the city, and he can pay her generously. As a show of good faith, he asks the girl to dig into his pocket, and to her surprise, there is a fresh carrot in it. She hurriedly eats it while Jiang Chen explains that he has a lot more fresh vegetables like that. After a while, the girl introduces herself as Sun Zhao and accepts Jiang Chen's offer. However, she warns him one last time that if he asks for any unusual services, then she'll blow his head off. After promising that all he needs is an experienced guide, Sun Zhao asks Zhang Chen what he is looking for in the city. He reveals that what he's searching for is technology, just like the laser gun Sun Zhao is currently wielding and the portable computer attached to her arm. He explains that they couldn't make those things from where he came from, so he was hoping to find some of them in the deserted city. Sun Zhao gets suspicious at what he's saying, and she points out that many people could easily assemble and create their technology. She demands to know the truth from him. Zhang Chen quickly thinks of a lie and explains that their technology is more advanced when it comes to food production and transportation. However, their general technology is lacking in comparison. That's why he's there. Meanwhile, Sun Zhao also lists out what she wants in exchange for helping him. Jiang Chen gets nervous because he doesn't really have any idea what currency this world is currently using. Thankfully, the girl quickly tells him she can be paid through sea batteries, food, or crystals. Personally, she would prefer to be paid in food, especially the canned chicken curry Jiang Chen had earlier. Jiang Chen admits that he already ran out of those since she had already eaten it all earlier. Sun Zhao quickly gets angry and threatens to stomp on Jiang Chen again. A crying Jiang Chen finally relents and promises to pay her 10 cans of food per month. He would even take care of all her meals. With their negotiation complete, Sun Zhao unties Jiang Chen from his chair. Jiang Chen announces that this current hideout they're using will be their meeting place for now. Sun Zhao didn't want to because they were right in the middle of the city, but Jiang Chen insisted that it was the perfect place for them. Zombies and foreign creatures roam the streets outside, and everything is already in ruin. This is Jiang Chen's hometown, Wanghai City, in the year 2190. He, who had just graduated from college in 2017, shouldn't even be there. However, he had just traveled through time, and right now, he had traveled to a parallel universe just like Earth, but with monsters. Never in his wildest dreams could prepare Jiang Chen for having this powerful ability. As for the reason he has this power, well, it all started a few months ago. On this typical day, a strange beam of light was flying through space and is now falling towards Earth. In Wanghai City on top of his apartment building, Jiang Chen is on a phone call with his mom. Just like a typical deadbeat son, he's calling to ask for money again while he's still looking for a job. His mom isn't happy with him and even points out how his cousin is already working for a high-tech enterprise right after graduation. If he's having trouble looking for jobs, his mom asks him to come home to their province and just help with the farm. After the stressful phone call, Jiang Chen opens a can of beer and ponders about his life. He's 23 years old, already a year after graduating, and he still doesn't have a decent job. His drunk self notices a green shooting star streaking across the horizon, so he decides to make a wish. He wishes for a comfortable job where he can finally reach the peak of his life. He laughs out loud while daydreaming about his successful future, but suddenly, the shooting star changes direction and is now heading straight for him. 
He couldn't even react as the star charged at him and exploded in a fiery explosion. It may sound ridiculous, but this accident is what gave him his unique and powerful ability. After getting hit by the star, a strange symbol gets tattooed on his arm, giving him the powers of multiverse travel. A few days later, he discovered that if he absorbed 100 kilowatts of power, the spaces between the tattoos would fill up and requirements to perform a multiverse journey would be met. In addition to this world-traveling ability, the tattoo also contains an independent subspace, which is basically a storage dimension of roughly one cubic meter in size. Jiang Chen used his ability to visit different versions of Earth, since the butterfly effect states that any small changes could magnify infinitely and alter the course of the future. This would mean that our planet's future is extremely uncertain. This would also mean there's an infinite version of Earth where certain events changed it. On his first multiverse travel, Jiang Chen found himself transported into an abandoned house. After reading some newspaper strewn inside the house, Jiang Chen learned that he was still in Wanghai City, but it's now the year 2190. Nuclear war had ravaged the world which produced uncontrolled mutation. He tries to look out the window to survey his surroundings, but he quickly hides as a strange, mutated creature walks past it. He realized that he might be in a very dangerous place so he quickly multiverse traveled back to his own dimension. The tattoo was already drained after one trip, so he once again jams his fingers in the outlet to recharge it. After thinking about it, Zhang Chen discerns that there might be something precious back in the post-apocalyptic world and he wants to explore it more. But first he needs to prepare. He heads to the grocery store to stock up on non-perishable canned goods and other emergency supplies. After putting it all in his survival backpack, he travels back to the post-apocalyptic world. This time, the portal placed him in the middle of the destroyed city, but thankfully it was dead quiet. It seems that the zombies don't go out in broad daylight, however he still must be extremely cautious since he doesn't know anything about this world yet. First he needs to find a base. After walking around for a while he spots a nearby building which looks to be the perfect space. It was separated from other structures with high walls and gates. After sneaking in, the door is locked so he decides to go in through the window. The place looked deserted, and he was about to relax when someone abruptly grabbed his legs. He freaks out and kicks the person but to his surprise, it was a beautiful woman. He picks up the woman and asks him what happened. The woman replies that she's dying of thirst, so Jiang Chen quickly drops her and retrieves his water bottle. After pouring some water down her mouth, the woman now tells him that she's starving so he drops her once more to open some of his canned food. After feeding her, she quickly tied him up which now led to his present situation. They had just finalized their partnership and Sun Jiao is now barricading their building's front doors on Jiang Chen's orders. Even though he was just tied up earlier, Jiang Chen was thankful that he met someone with a conscience instead of a cannibal or slave trader. She asks him how he gets his supplies inside the city, but Jiang Chen assures her that she doesn't need to worry about that. While Sun Jiao continues her work, Jiang Chen's eyes wander around the room. Numerous expensive looking paintings were hanging on the walls, but he realized that the people who painted those probably weren't even born yet so they are worthless back in his world. What he really wants are the various high-tech gadgets Sun Zhao had with her. He picks one of the devices up and asks Sun Zhao about it. Sun Zhao explains to him that most electronic devices stopped working after the nuclear explosion, but they can still be repaired and can often be traded for useful things at survivor bases. Upon hearing her explanation, Jiang Chen concludes that since it's still made of stuff from before the nuclear war, then someone in his world must be able to produce this technology again and make him rich. If he trades some food for it, then everyone would want to be willing to trade technology with him. After all, in this post-apocalyptic world, people with technology skills must be many while the supply of food is low. Sun Jiao speaks up and points out that she doesn't understand why she needs to reinforce the doors. Brainless zombies wouldn't know they were inside if they kept quiet and there were no powerful mutants in the area. However, Jiang Chen explains that they're reinforcing the doors against human intruders, not monsters. He plans to hang around the city for a while so they can use that place as their supply point. When Jiang Chen asks her if she has a map of the surrounding area, Sun Zhao asks for his iPad so she can just send it to him. When she notices that Jiang Chen has no idea what she's talking about, she shows him her wristwatch and explains that it's an A-pad or EP she commends John Chen for traveling without one since it even protects you from radiation. She gives him the E-pad she's wearing and when John Chen presses it, it lists out all his details including physical state, 
radiation level, and abnormal state. She starts teasing him for having all his abilities lower than 20 points. Jiang Chen was about to start flirting back at her, but he realized that she might be too dangerous for that. Meanwhile, Sun Jiao also realizes that maybe she shouldn't offend her current employer who's going to feed her delicious food. Jiang Chen knows that this post-apocalyptic world is full of treasures waiting for him. Any of the simple civilian equipment here is already way ahead of all the technology back in his old world. However, it would be impractical and dangerous for him to bring these high-tech devices directly back and sell them. So instead, he announces to Sun Zhou that his first target is the gold of the city. In a post-apocalyptic world, gold should have zero value. Most survivors would prioritize food more than shiny metals. But for Jiang Chen, it's the only cashable thing. Sun Zhao tries to ask her why he wants gold, but he doesn't want to reveal that he's from another world yet. Thus, he instead gives her bread and promises to provide any other food she might need. For her lunch, he hands her canned food so she can eat it outside while she's out on missions. Sun Zhao stares longingly at the food. All her life, she had seen villains murdering their own kind for food in this wasteland. She had met cannibalistic bandits who tried to cook and eat her. For the first time in his life, she has now met a man who worries about her going hungry. She shyly thanks Jiang Chen for the food and promises to do her best to find the gold sitting in the city bank's vault. Their only problem now would be transporting all that gold back to their base. The EMP created by the nuclear blasts has destroyed most of the electronics in the city, including all the vehicles. Unless they get professional repairmen, there is no way to get a drivable car. Jiang Chen tells her that she should just focus on investigating her mission and come back before dark. Zombies get smarter when the sun goes down. With her mission parameters laid out, Sun Zhao packs all her stuff and heads out of their base. Before she leaves, Jiang Chen asks to see her EP status and to his utter shock, all her abilities are more than 40 points, double his own. She also has different kinds of vaccines. A few minutes after she leaves, Jiang Chen also activates his powers and travels back to Earth. He was about to recharge his powers at his outlet again, but he realized that it would take too much time. If Sun Zhao returns and finds him missing, there will be trouble. Instead, he sneaks into their building's main electric circuit breaker and absorbs the electricity from there. Unfortunately, this caused their whole building to short circuit and lose electricity. Before the angry residents could find him, he fled back to his room. He realizes that he should first find a solution to his charging problem. He can try modifying his apartment circuit, but the abnormally high power consumption would surely attract unwanted attention. He sincerely wishes that he can find something else to replace electricity as his source of power. Jiang Chen also reads through his EP wristwatch and finds out that he will need to stock it with iodine if he wants to control his body's radiation level. He tries putting some iodine tincture on it, and he happily learns that it works. After his stressful excursion in the other world, he decides that he needs to eat first if he wants to think of a plan. Using his cooking skills, he manages to create a very delicious meal from simple ingredients. While eating, he couldn't help but wonder how much gold his food would trade for in the other world. He refills his bag with supplies and heads back to the other world. Surprisingly, his multiversal jump only drains some of his tattoo's charge. Did its maximum capacity increase because he charged it on a stronger source? He decides to not think about it anymore, but instead explore the house more. In the kitchen, he finds the main power switch, and upon switching it on, the kitchen's appliance all surprisingly turn on. Futuristic technology truly is awesome. Jiang Chen notices some movement outside, but when he looks at it through his binoculars, it is only Sun Zhao returning from her mission. She was jumping up the gate when Jiang Chen abruptly pressed the button and opened it, causing her to fall. She angrily punches Zhang Chen, but reports that she managed to clear the bank of zombies. The bank's vaults are sealed, but she did retrieve some gold bars from the VIP room. She throws the bag of gold to Zhang Chen, who can't even lift it. In exchange, he throws her a can of soda, which she happily drinks. After settling back inside their base, they discuss their next plan of action. If they want to blow the vault wide open, they will need some powerful explosives or highly skilled hackers. They can find these two in survivor bases like Leading Town. However, it is a slightly expensive town compared to others nearer to them. Except for residents and laborers, visitors must pay one energy unit's worth of crystals or items of equivalent value to enter. Of course, this once again doesn't make any sense to Zhang Chen. To explain further, Sun Zhao pulls out an energy crystal and shows it to him. Only formidable mutants are capable of crystallizing it on the back of their heads 
and these crystals contain energy units. The one she has currently had 37 energy units and he can check it using his EP watch. If possible, she doesn't want to bump into more formidable mutants for the time being. Jiang Chen picks up the crystal, while Sun Jiao further elucidates how one energy unit of crystal is equal to one-tenth of a box of canned meat or half a box of crappy canned food. It can also be converted to 10 tubes of nutrient solutions, one C-type battery, or three energy weapon clips. In summary, there are so many things that can be exchanged with and is the de facto currency at many survivor bases. Jiang Chen also notices that the crystal also charges his tattoo. He offers four cans of food for 37 energy units of crystals, which Sun Zhao of course easily accepts. After the transaction, she advises him not to trade at a loss with others because they might take advantage of him. Although 10 energy units of crystals are worth a can of food, it also depends on what kind of food. The canned foods in survivor bases are mostly mutant fish meat, some with sand or human meat even mixed in them. Meanwhile, Jiang Chen's canned foods are chicken curry, braised beef, and many others. These are delicacies that even she had never tasted before. In fact, she once tasted mutant cow beef, a rare food that is wanted by everyone. Even though it was dry, she found it extremely satisfying. Jiang Chen thanks her for her advice, but he also realizes something. He is pathetically weak in this world. If Sun Jiao tries to take his food by force, he has no chance against her. He looks at the gold bars he gained and wonders if he should stop while he's ahead. It's already a lot of treasure, and if he stays for longer, he can be made into a can of food, mutate due to radiation, or just normally die on the streets. Thankfully, Sun Jiao speaks up and informs him that since he's her employer, she will also ensure his safety and make sure he doesn't get tricked by people. After all, if he loses his wealth, it would also be a problem for her. Zhang Chen smiles warmly at her kind offer. Meanwhile, Sun Zhou gets distracted when she opens the refrigerator and sees all the food that Jiang Chen has brought with him. Thus, Jiang Chen announces that they shouldn't eat canned food all the time so for tonight. He'll cook for her to celebrate his first employee. He hands her some tomatoes and announces that for tonight, they will be eating tomato fried eggs. In the past, Sun Zhao had lived happily with her family even though they were in poverty. Compared to the nuclear winter outside, the inside of their home was warm with her parents and little sister. She only learned later in her life that a lot of mercenary groups specifically target newly opened shelters like theirs. They took advantage of the remaining kindness that the people in the shelter had and robbed them of everything. Ever since that incident, she gradually grew up and became the qualified and battle-hardened wasteland survivor she is today. Her sad thoughts were then interrupted when Jiang Chen suddenly scolded her for chopping the tomatoes too hard. He explains to her that they should be gentle with the ingredients so that they can draw and pour their heart into each cooking process. Only then can they be rewarded with a scrumptious dish. They then feast on the eggs and Sun Zhao can't help but point out that Jiang Chen seems to be someone who came straight out of a fairy tale. In the books she read as a child, stories where everyone lives happily, has families and friends are called fairy tales and Zhang Chen seems to be from that kind of place. Zhang Chen ponders her words and leaves the table. When he returns, he deposits multiple cans of beer on the table and invites Sun Zhou to drink with him. At first, Sun Zhou didn't like the taste of beer, but Zhang Chen explained that it would help them get everything out. After drinking a few cans, Zhang Chen starts telling her about how harsh Earth is. They might not have mutants, but the monster called Graduation is the bane of all college students. It drains their money and will to live while forcing them to live in a completely unfamiliar city. They then must go find work and have bosses who will torture them their whole working lives. Sun Zhao drunkenly announces that with her physical stats, she wouldn't let anyone torture her. A few seconds later, they scuffle with each other, and in their drunken states, they spend the night together. The next morning, the two head out of their base. Jiang Chen looks at the overcast clouds above them and wonders if it's about to rain prompting Sun Zhou to point out that those aren't clouds but radiation dust. Thankfully, they don't have to worry about radiation if there's iodine in their EP. They would only need protective suits when going through high radiation areas like reactors in former government buildings. Jiang Chen didn't want to go out of their base, but Sun Zhao convinced him that he needed to learn how to protect himself. That means he should accompany her to a nearby survival camp and learn about the world. As they near a zombie-infested area, she prompts Jiang Chen to hold out his weapon. Her own weapon is the laser rifle, the best option when fighting zombies thanks to its low noise and high accuracy. 
However, it would be better for Zhang Chen to use kinetic weapons first to familiarize himself with shooting. His assault rifle might not be the most accurate, but its power and reliability are better than laser weapons. They walk past various large mutant animals, but Sun Zhao assures him that they won't be attacked. Not all creatures are aggressive. The giant rats might be huge, but they still have an innate fear of humans. The cockroaches won't attack living things either. As for zombies, they stop moving during the day because the mutant cells on the back of their heads require a stable environment to carry out photosynthesis. The real danger to the two of them is the carnivores. They usually feed on zombies and other mutant animals, but they also eat humans. Lastly, the other dangerous enemies are other humans. If someone aims at their heads, he should fire back at once. Jiang Chen is starting to realize how dangerous their situation really is when Sun Jiao suddenly quiets him down. As they enter another section of the city, Sun Jiao mentions how something seems off. All the mutants nearby have slowly disappeared which only means one thing. Something else more powerful is most likely around. Suddenly, a loud explosion reverberates in the distance and the sound of battle fills the air. Sun Jiao quickly runs toward the noise, making Jiang Chen shout at her that they should run in the opposite direction. However, she was already so far away that he had no choice but to follow. Meanwhile, a group of soldiers are trying to fight a building-sized mutant. They focus their firepower on the monster, but it doesn't seem to have any effect. On the other hand, just a swipe from one of the mutant's many tentacles was enough to blast one of them back onto a wall. The large mutant is called a Meat Mountain, and Sun Zhou wonders why such a mutant suddenly showed up here. One of the soldier's cannons fires a rocket at the meat monster, taking out a large chunk of its neck, but this just seemed to anger the meat monster more who lets out a terrifying roar. The soldier's cannon fired another round, this time directly hitting the meat monster in the head. Its head explodes and the meat monster topples to the ground dead. The meat monster's thick fat is almost impervious to all individual weapons while its bad habit of hurling things at enemies makes it a terrifying foe. The soldier's anti-tank cannon is one of the few things that could destroy the big guy. Zhang Chen wonders why they need to destroy the mutant in the first place, so Zhang Chen explains that the soldiers are probably collecting crystals. Other than that, the fat of the meat mountain can be used as fertilizers or can be added to nutrient solutions. The thought of eating any part of the monster makes Zhang Chen want to barf, but Sun Zhou calls out to him and tells him to hurry up. When one of the soldiers spots them, they welcome them to their survivor base named Sixth Street and ask for their gene code. Gene code is basically the unique identifier of people that the EP can show. In the post-apocalyptic world, it is used as one's ID many survival camps that have law and order perform an inspection of gene codes before letting people enter. This is so they can arrest criminals who have violated laws before and to ensure the safety of the camp. After the soldier checks their identity, the gate opens and the two enter Jiang Chen's first survivor camp. It was the first time he saw civilization in a post-apocalyptic world, and he can only conclude that it looks abnormal. The level of technology everyone has seems disproportionate. One soldier seems normal carrying a rifle while smoking a cigarette, while another merchant is calculating goods through a hologram computer. People with missing limbs seem abundant, but some of them use canes while others are equipped with cybernetic enhancements that are more agile than human legs. The living standards are also disproportionate. Numerous men and women looking like bags of bones litter the street. Sun Jiao explains to him that six streets laws are very simple. Murder and theft are punishable by shooting, tax fraud results in eviction, and intentional harm lands one in jail. What catches Jiang Chen's attention is when someone abruptly hits one of the skinny beggars on the streets with a baton. He was just about to intervene when Sun Zhao stopped him. He angrily asks why the guy wasn't shot if murder wasn't allowed but Sun Zhao points out that the guy wielding the baton is the inspector responsible for cleaning up corpses in the slums. She then leads Jiang Chen deeper into the base. Since they're just going to exchange some useful stuff, they should just head to the external market instead of entering the expensive inner circle. Even though the external market is filthy, it's still better than the slums. Thieves or criminals shot dead will have their bodies dragged to the farm where they will be used as fertilizers. Some of the more famous thieves would be coated in formalin and nailed on wood as a warning to other criminals. Along the way, Jiang Chan sees a group of dejected-looking girls with collars on their necks and barcodes on their chests. A merchant was selling them and bartering with robot buyers. The robot buyers then led the sleigh girls into a truck and sent them on their way. 
Sun Zhao angrily watches the spectacle and voices out how disgusted she is that the girls would probably be sent to New Ray Hotel. It might be called a hotel, but it's a whorehouse that takes pride in providing all kinds of services to its clientele. As for the slave merchant, he's probably from the force that had seized Shelter 101. A shelter is a strange establishment in the post-apocalyptic world. Each shelter has its own unique design philosophy, but their main goal is to ensure a maximum survival rate. Sun Zhao was born in Shelter 071, where their design philosophy is that everything is standardized, including procedures and people's behavior. Although their lives were rigid, she was happy. Some of the shelters were not as lucky as hers. In Shelter 070, it was rumored that the design philosophy was to govern by motivating people through creating a spiritual leader. Unfortunately, it didn't even last 10 years. The spiritual leader and model of virtue abandoned his morals and converted the shelter into a tribe. He then got rid of all the males, leaving only the females as his. As for Shelter 101, where the slave merchant probably gets his slaves, it is a humanless shelter. Instead of storing humans, it stores the DNA of the elite people in the past. At the end of the lockdown period, the embryo culture tanks inside the shelter are then activated and the perfect bodies are created. These bodies then gain decades worth of memories in a short amount of time using virtual systems. The slave merchant is probably using these embryo culture tanks to produce slaves. A few minutes later, they finally reach the external market where a trading robot greets them. The trading robot's job is to evaluate the prices of goods that meet the needs of the camp. The trading robot is supposed to be emotionless, but even it is surprised when Zhang Chen shows it the items he is planning to sell. The robot scans the item and learns that the canned food is completely radiation-free, something that would be impossible in the wasteland. Not only that, it also contains what pre-war humans called fresh beef. The robot asks Zhang Chen if he has more products like this, and Zhang Chen happily replies that he does. Therefore, he was immediately treated as a VIP and was sent to their VIP room. In the VIP room, an extremely beautiful woman welcomes Zhang Chen. As Zhang Chen surveys the tear room, the woman and Sun Zhao exchange glances, with Sun Zhao smirking while the woman sighs in exasperation. An hour later, Zhang Chen and Sun Zhao exited the VIP room. Sun Zhao was disappointed that they only got 50 crystals for each can of food, but it was fine with Zhang Chen. She tries to explain to him that his food is luxury goods, meaning that they can easily get paid double for it in the inner circle, but Zhang Chen's only concern is that one crystal can charge his tattoo up to 30%. He could just get more food from back on Earth. Sun Zhao also smiles and reveals that the VIP room isn't just a place to exchange valuable goods. It's where special clients get special services. In fact, if she wasn't with Zhang Chen, he would probably get the full service earlier. Zhang Chen controls his blush and replies to her that he just wants her. In response, she abruptly kisses him. But it wasn't for the reason he thought. Someone was following them, so she pretended they were lovers to make them seem less threatening. They then head to their next destination, the clinic. Inside, the doctor injects Zhang Chen with different vaccines. These include the Type T vaccine, which will prevent zombie infections and a multitude of gene-enhancing shots. It was a bit costly, but Zhang Chen was rich and it was a necessity. Afterward, Sun Zhao leads him to a firearm store before retiring for the night in one of the hotels in the inner circle of the base. A few hours later, an intruder is now tied up on the floor of Zhang Chen and Sun Zhao's hotel room as they discuss what to do with the intruder. According to the laws of the base, they have the right to shoot intruders without asking for any reason. And so Sun Zhao puts her pistol directly at the intruder's forehead and asks him who sent him. To know what has led to this scenario, we must go back to about half an hour ago. Zhang Chen was just peacefully eating some canned fruits while Sun Zhou abruptly disappeared somewhere. And then, a tied-up body was tossed inside their window with Sun Zhou climbing after him. The intruder was crying and exclaiming that kidnapping is against the law, but Sun Zhou points out his attire marks him as a refugee. Therefore, he has no reason to be in the prosperous district where their hotel is. She then points her pistol at the intruder's crotch and orders him to reveal everything he knows. The intruder panics and confesses that he truly doesn't know anything. Sun Zhao was about to shoot him when Zhang Chen abruptly stopped her. He cheerfully explains to the intruder that he doesn't want to solve problems with violence, but if he won't stop pretending to be dumb, then Zhang Chen himself would feed the intruder to the mutant dogs. 
Of course, if the intruder instead chooses to cooperate, he would be willing to give him a crystal worth 100 energy units. This immediately changes the intruder's allegiance, and he reveals that it was the Ashes Mercenary Corps that hired him to tail them. It all started when they went to the pawn shop. The Ashes boss saw how Jiang Chen had high-quality food which translates to a lot of crystals. Seeing the opportunity, he and his men followed them to the VIP room and continued to watch them, determining if Jiang Chen truly was a lamb worth slaughtering. They saw that the VIP room's most beautiful woman was the one who serviced Jiang Chen, which further reinforces their belief that Jiang Chen is rich. However, the presence of Sun Zhao gave them pause, so they decided to watch a little bit longer to make sure they didn't piss off the wrong guy. He orders his men to get an informant while he continues tailing the two newcomers. No matter what, they cannot make any moves within the bounds of the 6th Street Survivor base. If they want to capture Zhang Chen, then they would have to do it outside the base. The Ashes boss followed and watched as Zhang Chen visited the clinic and the firearm store. When their informant arrived, which was the current intruder, he ordered him to tail the two strangers and warn them the moment they exited the city. That would be the moment they would pounce. If they succeed, he promised to pay the informant five units of crystals. The Ashes boss explains to his men that these newcomers truly seem to be lambs ready for slaughter. They bought bullets and firearms which means no powerful force is backing them up. Anyone recognizable has their own production of firearms so if these two were part of some group, then they wouldn't have to buy weapons. Instead, they spent crystals buying ammo so these two must be just lucky scavengers that found some treasure in the wasteland. This is all the information the intruder revealed to Zhang Chen and Sun Zhao. He would happily trade the mercenary group for 100 units of energy since that would ensure an extravagant lifestyle for him for at least a month. He was daydreaming about his happy future when the barrel of a gun suddenly rested on his forehead and blew his brains out. It was Zhang Chen who was shaking from the murder. The trauma of murdering someone truly affected him, so Sun Zhao tells him that he should leave the murdering to her. Jiang Chen resolutely states to Sun Zhao that he can't let her do all the murdering herself. He must get used to it too. In response, Sun Zhao hugged her warmly and promised to never leave him. From that moment on, Jiang Chen realizes that he couldn't really detach himself from this post-apocalyptic world. If he must go back to Earth, then he'll bring Sun Zhao with him. They then took a shower together, and Jiang Chen couldn't help but compliment how good his body now looks after the gene shot. Afterward, they have the hotel staff clean off the body. The concierge was very apologetic for letting an intruder get past their security and offered them a free dinner. However, they quickly reject him since anything Jiang Chen cooks is infinitely better than whatever they serve at their restaurant. Jiang Chen summons rice from his spatial storage space and cooks it in a rice cooker. Sun Jiao sees this, but she doesn't question it anymore since she knows Zhang Chen won't answer it anyway. They then start the feast, with the two of them easily obliterating all the food prepared. Zhang Chen was surprised that the pot of rice which in the past was good enough for him for three days was already empty after just one meal. It seems that the gene shot truly enhances everything about the human body, including its need for nutrients. After their dinner, they start discussing once more their bank heist. Sun Zhao projects the bank's blueprint and tells Jiang Chen the details. The bank is in a prosperous district of the city, meaning that its zombie density and radiation levels are extremely high. Moreover, the place is haunted by a dangerous mutant species. Sun Zhao continues her explanation, but she notices that Jiang Chen isn't listening. Instead, he was staring intently at the piece of technology creating the hologram. It looks like a normal pen, but Sun Jiao explains that it's a computer hologram. It's not as reliable as a wrist computer, but its performance is far superior. With Jiang Chen's curiosity out of the way, Sun Zhao shows him the dangerous mutant species she was talking about, a Death Claw. Death Claws has a crystal index of 40 to 50, is fast and agile, and has a keen sense of smell. It is protected by a highly compact full-body armor so normal kinetic bullets are incapable of causing it any real damage. In summary, the best thing to do when someone comes across a death claw is to run at once. Even though it's also very unlikely that you can escape, death claws usually roam the places hit by nuclear bombs, but it wanders around the city too hunting for zombies. To succeed in their bank breaking mission, Sun Zhao suggests two options. One, they can infiltrate the underground vault via a route she found and blast it open with explosives. The other option is to proceed to the main control room, hack into the system to gain authorization, and then follow the regular route into the vault which they will open by using the combination lock. 
Jiang Chen was amazed at the details of Sun Zhou's maps. He was curious if it was also reliable, but Sun Zhou alleviated his worries by confessing that her information came from Leading Town. The town has the most complete map database in the region since they were able to download the data from pre-war satellites. Jiang Chen is always hearing about the Leading Town from her, so he asked her what exactly it is. Sun Zhao reveals that it's a survivor base and an aircraft carrier. With two plans presented before him, Jiang Chen now must decide. He decides that the first plan might be too dangerous. Blasting the vault open with explosives is not exactly a quiet activity. If they attract a whole street's worth of zombies, then there's no way they can escape. Jiang Chen agrees with this assessment since even though the zombies go dormant during the day, they still launch attacks upon receiving intense simulation. As for plan number two, its main weakness is they don't have hackers. Unfortunately, Sun Zhao admits that she's also not that good at hacking. All she can do is shoot, which is all the skills one needs to survive in the wasteland. However, there are actually quite a few expert hackers, and they don't often live in the best conditions, so it doesn't cost a lot to hire one. In fact, they can hire some of them right here in the slums of 6th Street. All the people without combat skills live there. Now the only problem they have left is how to deal with the Ashes Mercenary Corps. In their eyes, Jiang Chen is still a big fat target. He also has a feeling that they would probably make their move when they're leaving the area or continue following them around until they become off guard. Jiang Chen thinks up a plan and whispers it to Sun Zhao, who is surprised at how badass it is. The next day, Jiang Chen heads out to the slums to speak to the employer there. It was the midst of summer, but the radiation dust was so thick that it seemed like winter for Zhang Chen. The employer in the slums bows to Zhang Chen and shows him the details of one of their expert hackers. Reading through the candidate's details, he noticed that it was the vice president of a pre-war technology company. He angrily points this out to the employer and demands that he wants one with technical knowledge, as the employer goes back to his computer to look for another candidate. Meanwhile, Zhang Chen looks at the employer and sees his high status in the base. The employer is also the boss of a canned food company, so he has a high influence. Zhang Chen decides that he'll buy the canned factory in the future so that he doesn't have any more trouble with his food supply. He had to scrape off the production dates on the canned food he bought from Earth so nobody would get suspicious, but if he had his own factory, then he wouldn't have to do that anymore. Jiang Chen walks nearer to the fence surrounding the slums and a few minutes later, the employer approaches him. He hands him a stack of papers with information on the technical experts they currently have. Jiang Chen reads through the papers and notices one peculiar thing. He asks the employer why all these people seem to be ex-convicts. The employer nervously laughs and apologizes. However, that's something he couldn't change. The employer explains that every person in the slums receives a subsistence allowance from the government of 6th Street, meaning they are technically the property of the base. The only ones permitted to be sold outside are either the worthless individuals incapable of labor or criminals. However, he assures Jiang Chen that the criminal will follow his every command. They will put an electronic collar on the employee which will explode if they don't follow their master's command. Jiang Chen realizes that he has no other choice, so he reads through the papers again. He was about to make his choice when the slums guard suddenly pointed his gun near Jiang Chen and ordered one of the slum residents to stop. The slum resident was a young girl who is now clinging to Jiang Chen. The girl apologizes to Jiang Chen for eavesdropping on their conversation, but she begs him to buy her. She promises that she is good with computers. The guard picks up the girl and proceeds to bring her back inside the slums. Meanwhile, the employer profusely apologizes to Jiang Chen for allowing someone to bother him. Jiang Chen asks him what will happen to the girl now and the employer informs him that she will be punished by being sent to the labor camp. Normally, people above the age of 16 wear bracelets that restrict exit from the slums, but the girl is underdeveloped for her age, so she doesn't have one. Jiang Chen then informs the employer that he decided to buy the girl. The girl would surely die if she was sent to the labor camp, and he was pretty sure that she wasn't some plant put there by the Ashes Corps. The employer tells him to return the next day to retrieve the girl and sign papers, but Jiang Chen promises to tip the guy if he can leave now with the girl. The employer readily agrees, and he runs back to process the papers. A few minutes later, he returns with the girl and a contract. Jiang Chen signs the contract and the employer happily leaves with the crystals in his pocket. Now Jiang Chen only must learn more about his newest employee. To start, the girl shyly introduces herself as Yao Yao. 
She tells him that she has achieved a B grade from the virtual education system in computing and she can do programming and hacking well. Zhang Chen teases her and asks her why she's still so poor if she's good at what she does, but Yao Yao nervously points out that many people in the slums can do what she can too. However, she promises that even if her ability might not be the best, her potential will make sure that he won't lose money on her. Jiang Chen smiles at the cute girl and wraps her in his jacket. He then pets her on the head and asks her to follow me. The girl tears up from his kindness and happily walks beside him. Back at their hotel, Sun Zhao asks Jiang Chen if he truly likes girls so much that he even bought one. Jiang Chen defends his choice and points out that Yao Yao has the computing talent they need. He had already checked, and she should be safe from the influence of the Ashes Mercenary Corps. Of course, Sun Zhao wasn't satisfied with Jiang Chen's own interrogation, and she put her finger on Yao Yao's chin. She then asks her if she knows Zhou Goping. Yao Yao shakes her head and tells her she doesn't. Staring intently at her eyes, Sun Zhao discerns that she isn't lying. Next, she abruptly rips off Yao Yao's clothes and announces that she's going to search her body now. Jiang Chen hurriedly turns around and exits the room, while Sun Zhao checks the girl for transmission devices or weapons. When she was satisfied, she handed Yao Yao some clothes. Jiang Chen and Sun Zhao then introduced themselves and welcomed her to the team. He is about to remove her electrical collar, but strangely, Yao Yao retreats and tells him that she doesn't want it removed. Jiang Chen is confused by her reaction, but Yao Yao tells him that she is already blessed to have such a kind master. She hopes that he won't abandon her. Sun Jiao explains to Zhang Chen what Yao Yao meant. In their world, everything can happen like siblings betraying each other or lovers murdering each other. If Jiang Chen removed Yao Yao's electrical collar, then Yao Yao would feel that Zhang Chen might start being on guard against her. Zhang Chen understood that his way of thinking might not be applicable in this cruel future. Yao Yao believes that if she continues wearing the collar, then Zhang Chen might feel more at ease. This would lessen her worry that she might get abandoned. Zhang Chen pats her on the head once more and agrees with her. While Yao Yao leaves with Sun Zhou to go take a bath, Zhang Chen decides that he would need to change his outlook. The people of this world, including the two girls, probably consider his kindness as something childish. In the bathroom, Sun Zhou also tries her best to ease Yao Yao's nervousness. She assures her that they treat their people well, and she also compliments Yao Yao's unblemished skin. Yao Yao reveals that her skin's good condition was because of the sleeping pod model II. It has the function of improving one's body condition. She entered the sleeping pod when she was 12, and although she probably spent 20 years in it, her actual body only grew by two years. Together with her two years living in 6th Street, the doctor informed her that her body age is 16 years old while her mental age is 14. Sun Jiao starts teasing her about how she's technically 32 so she'd be older than her. Yao Yao frowns and the two splashes around the bathtub. Outside the bathroom, Jiang Chen is preparing their dinner. He hears the commotion inside the bathroom, and he didn't expect that the two girls would get familiar with each other so quickly. When they exit the bath, Sun Zhao heads directly to the table to drink a can of soda and invites Yao Yao to eat with her. Seeing all the food prepared just for her, Yao Yao couldn't believe her eyes. The food looked plenty and delicious, most of it something she had never seen before. She bites her hand to make sure that she's not dreaming. Jiang Chen invited her to start eating before Sun Zhao could finish all the food. She sat down beside them with tears in her eyes, and for the first time in a long while, she felt what she could only describe as happiness. The next morning, the silence among the ruins outside 6th Street was interrupted by a loud explosion. Through its streets, Jiang Chen is running with Yao Yao in his arms. Meanwhile, Sun Zhao leads them through the maze of alleyways while mercenaries try to shoot at them from the rooftops. When they successfully escape, the mercenary curses and calls to their comrades on the other sections, informing them of their prey's location. At the same time, Sun Zhao is leading the others to the trap they have all prepared. Jiang Chen is amazed at how valiant Sun Zhao is despite her wearing heels. She could still easily run and jump around. Thankfully, everything is still going according to their plan. A few hours earlier, after they left the hotel, Jiang Chen and the others first headed over to the markets. There, they bought equipment for Yao Yao to do her hacking job. Yao Yao's smile could clearly be seen since his master was giving her her own equipment. After they exited the survivor base, Jiang Chen could already feel that he was being targeted. It seems that the gene shot not only increased his appetite and physical abilities, but also his senses as well. 
Sun Jiao advises them to ignore their stalkers and just follow the plan. One part of the city they were passing through is the perfect place for an ambush. Sun Jiao knows this and advises the others to stop while she surveys the surroundings. It was very quiet, but she still discerned the hidden mercenaries on the rooftops. She whispers to Zhang Chen to carry Yao Yao, pulls out a grenade, and tosses it into the street. When the grenade explodes, they quickly start running. After escaping the mercenaries from the rooftop, the group rests in an abandoned building. Jiang Chen pants heavily since even with his genetic modification, carrying a person along was still tough for his body. Meanwhile, Sun Jiao tells them that they should prepare for a face-off against the mercenaries. They worry that they might get buried under the rubble if their plans go awry, but Sun Jiao assures Jiang Chen that the mercenaries would likely be more careful than them. After all, they are after Jiang Chen's money, and not just to indiscriminately murder. Outside the building, the mercenary strike team is being led by a man named Renjia. They had trouble catching up with Jiang Chen and the girls because unlike them, they aren't enhanced with genetic drugs. Renja wonders why a man would even waste money to inject his companions with such an expensive treatment. Nevertheless, they managed to corner their prey into an abandoned building. He was waiting for more of his men to arrive when out of nowhere, one of his soldiers fell dead with a bullet hole in his face. Jiang Chen and Sun Jiao start raining bullets down the street toward them, and Renja dives for cover. Jiang Chen laughs while showering them with bullets like a crazy madman. Renja couldn't believe that their prey was so rich that he was able to waste bullets by just shooting at someone in cover. Meanwhile, inside the building, Sun Zhao grabs hold of Jiang Chen and forces him to take cover. She scolds him for wasting bullets and shooting aimlessly. Jiang Chen sheepishly scratches his head and apologizes. He tells her that he used to play shooter games so he couldn't hold back now that he got to shoot a real gun for the first time. They continue fighting back while Yao Yao crouches in the corner shaking in fear. As the firefight continues, Renja's reinforcement finally arrives. It was a car with a machine gun mounted on top of it. The machine gun rains fire toward Jiang Chen's position, and Sun Jiao decides that they'd have to retreat now. Jiang Chen runs inside the building while Sun Jiao fires back at the enemies. When Sun Jiao was almost hit by a bullet, Renjia ordered his men to cease firing. Now that the guy has fled, they should at least capture the girl alive. The gunman stops shooting and shouts at Sun Jiao to surrender. In response, Sun Jiao shoots him directly in the throat, destroying him instantly. Renji goes back into cover just as Sun Jiao throws a grenade at them. She then uses the ensuing explosion to run away unhindered. Deeper inside the building, there was a manhole where Zhang Chen and Yao Yao are now hiding in. Yao Yao was worried about Sun Jiao, but Zhang Chen assures her that Sun Jiao is even stronger than him. Yao Yao looks at their surroundings and determines that they are now in the drainage system. This is a part of Jiang Chen's plan. He noticed this place when looking at the map Sun Zhao had. There was an entrance leading to the drainage system in the middle of the building where they had the shootout. Although the manhole was previously sealed, Sun Zhao had removed the obstacles when she was there previously. And just in time, Sun Zhao also drops down into the tunnel. Meanwhile, Renjia is screaming at his men to go find the girl. They were baffled since their foes seemed to have just disappeared into thin air. He orders them to carefully scout the whole building. In the tunnels, Sun Jiao sits on Jiang Chen's shoulders so that she can carefully seal the manhole cover. She had also installed a bomb and gave Jiang Chen the remote control. Now the last thing they must do is to detonate the bomb and complete their plan. Jiang Chen convinces himself that in this world, he has no reason to feel sympathy for their pursuers' lives. After all, they are also after their own lives. Above, the mercenaries had found the manhole cover they escaped from. Renjia and his men crowd around the manhole cover as they attempt to open it up. They couldn't let their prey go since they had already lost a lot of their own men. One of the soldiers spots a bomb wrapped around the column of the building, and he tries to warn his boss. However, Renjia was too caught up in his plans for revenge. The soldier runs away from the building just in time because down below, Jiang Chen presses the detonator. Simultaneously, the bombs in the abandoned building and in the manhole cover explode, causing the whole building to collapse and crushing everyone inside. Back in the tunnels, Jiang Chen and the others continue their journey towards the bank. Jiang Chen wonders if the leader of the Ashes Mercenary Corps will now hunt them more fiercely after they just wiped out their entire raid team. Sun Zhao laughs and replies that they will surely die if they try to return to the Sixth Street Survivor Base. It doesn't matter, however, since they can just trade in other bases or maybe, they can even finish off the Ashes Corps themselves. 
As they continued walking through the tunnel, Yao Yao couldn't help but be afraid as rats and other animals scurried around them. Zhang Chen puffs out his chest and promises to protect her, while Sun Zhao makes fun of him for not even being able to accurately shoot one of the mercenaries earlier in the fight. The group continues to walk along while unbeknownst to them, a monster picks up the rat behind them and viciously eats it. A few minutes later, Zhang Chen notices that his heart seems to be beating faster than usual. He keeps having an unlucky feeling and he urges the others to hurry up, so they exit the tunnels faster. They were walking through one of the tunnels when out of nowhere, a hail of bullets was shot towards them. Thankfully, Sun Zhao pushes them away just as the bullets hit the wall. One of the bullets managed to go through Sun Zhao's arm and it started bleeding profusely. She grabs hold of the wound while explaining to Zhang Chen that there are citizens who are dwelling in the dark underground channels. They specialize in living in the dark and it seems that now they have targeted them as their next meal. Meanwhile, Zhang Chen is stunned and horrified upon seeing Sun Zhou bleeding in front of him. He realized that she was injured because she tried to save him, meaning it was all his fault. Sun Zhou tries to convince them to escape while she stays behind and deals with them, but Zhang Chen disagrees. He charges at the group of mutant humans and slams one of their heads into the ground. His eyes flash in fury and his fangs grow as he angrily exclaims to Sun Zhou that he will not leave her behind. Zhang Chen's unbridled rage fuels him as the group of mutant humans encircle and attack him. However, he fights them off with his own hands and gun, enraged at the thought that he can't even protect his own woman. On the side of the tunnel, Sun Zhao concernedly looks at the rampaging Zhang Chen, realizing that if this carries on, Zhang Chen might truly be in danger. He kept bashing their heads like squashing ripe tomatoes while the mutated humans growled. Eventually, after wiping out the monsters, Zhang Chen calmed down. Yao Yao treated Sun Zhao, but Sun Zhao wanted the little girl to check on Zhang Chen first. As Zhang Chen walked still shaky, one of the mutated humans grabbed his leg with a knife. The monster pulled him down and swung the knife at our protagonist. Zhang Chen got stabbed, but not too deeply as he fought back. The mutated human tried to push the knife deeper. Zhang Chen struggled until gunshots rang out. The mutated human fell, and Yao Yao rushed toward Zhang Chen. Passing out, Zhang Chen could only see Yao Yao's concerned face. The next morning, Zhang Chen woke up in a bed, confused about what happened the previous day. Yao Yao entered, washed his face, and Sun Zhao asked if he felt better. Zhang Chen nodded, suggesting they had breakfast. As they ate, Zhang Chen remembered being pursued by mercenaries and finding an underground drainage. He did his best to recall the events. He remembered the gruesome scene below the ground. All he saw were dead bodies and bones, causing him to feel sick. The memory made him break into a cold sweat, and he could still imagine the foul smell. It was hard to believe that the underground drainage channels of the other world were filled with fear and death. Sun Zhao advised him to stop overthinking, explaining that the mutated humans down there were cannibals who would eat their own kind. That's why everyone despised them. Zhang Chen then informed the girls that he would be away for at least a month to gather more essential supplies. With a smile, Sun Zhao encouraged him to go and come back quickly. Zhang Chen brightened up and told them to continue eating. Later, while washing the dishes, Sun Zhao mentioned to Zhang Chen that his accumulated anger had made him go berserk. She clarified that genetic drugs usually enhance three basic abilities, but in some cases they could cause mutations like growing an extra head. Zhang Chen couldn't believe Sun Zhao had injected such a thing into him. Sun Zhao chuckled and said the chance was S-L-I-M. She then explained that some people had gained useful abilities. For instance, she showed her healthy body and revealed her resilience ability. She could speed up her metabolism to heal injuries, but it made her weak and could be fatal if used frequently. Sun Zhao advised Jiang Chen to use his ability sparingly, as it drained life force and suggested checking his EP. Opening his EP, Jiang Chen found the Rage ability, which enhanced his body temporarily. Sun Zhao cautioned him about its side effects, like feeling weak afterward, and warned that he could be in trouble if Rage wore off without defeating his enemy. She emphasized the importance of controlling the ability with a special drug she provided. Worried about Zhang Chen, Sun Zhao reassured him that the ability could be managed over time. She gave him the drug and instructed him to use it before employing his Rage ability. As a caring wife, she reminded him not to rely too much on his power. Shortly after, Zhang Chen received a few kilograms of gold from Sun Zhao and assured them he would return soon. He mentioned there was enough food for them for the next few months. Zhang Chen had noticed that Yao Yao had a new haircut. 
She mentioned that Sun Zhao had cut it for her, and Jiang Chen approved of Sun Zhao's haircutting skills. While he continued reminding them about the food, Sun Zhao suddenly jumped at Zhang Chen and gave him a deep kiss. She requested romantic words instead of constant reminders. Flustered, Jiang Chen tried to think of something. Just then, Yao Yao started pulling his hoodie and asked him not to leave. Jiang Chen told her to be a good girl before he came back, and suddenly, Yao Yao also kissed him and quickly escaped. A jealous wife started getting angry, and Jiang Chen asked Sun Zhao not to blame him. Yao Yao peeked and told Jiang Chen to make sure to come back. He then left the girls as the two saw him off. Soon after, Jiang Chen successfully returned to his home world. He noticed that it was the same time as in the other world. He was on the verge of a mental breakdown hearing gunshots and seeing corpses. He was glad to hear the familiar noise in his home world. He found a peaceful world the best. Jiang Chen suddenly remembered to do something and brought the bag full of gold bars somewhere. He then measured its weight and was shocked to see 35.5 kilograms of them. He swiftly performed a mental calculation, realizing he had become wealthy. Jiang Chen then pondered on what to purchase first with his newfound wealth. However, he suddenly remembered Sun Zhao and Yao Yao, who were patiently waiting for him. Temporarily pushing aside thoughts of the other world, he prepared a meal while considering the prospect of acquiring a lavish mansion and a car. During his meal, he contemplated the remaining gold in the alternate reality. After finishing his food, Jiang Chen retired to his bed and retrieved a device from the wasteland, a high-class holographic computer loaded with 100 terabytes of movies. Intrigued by the futuristic technology, he opened the movies only to be startled by loud Japanese moaning sounds echoing in his apartment. Quickly turning off the movie, Jiang Chen discovered that the computer was filled with such content. Recognizing his changed demeanor, he decided to focus on business matters. Leaving his apartment, Jiang Chen compared his tranquil world with the wasteland and the other world. Spotting a cicada, he felt relief at the sight of a normal creature. Considering the monstrous cockroaches he encountered in the other world, as he strolled around, Jiang Chen realized he might face legal issues if he deposited the gold in a bank without an invoice. Consequently, he decided to visit a nearby gold buyer instead. Jiang Chen had walked into the store and inquired if they accepted gold. The woman at the store mentioned they only dealt with top quality items, making Jiang Chen ask her to call her manager. Though the woman was initially unsure about Jiang Chen's credibility based on his appearance, she went to get her manager. When Jiang Chen displayed the contents of his backpack, the manager's eyes widened, treating him like a VIP. In an office, an appraiser verified that the gold was of high quality. The manager then inquired about an invoice, but Jiang Chen firmly stated he didn't have one. Consequently, the manager asked the appraiser to leave the office. Suspecting the gold's origin, the manager questioned Jiang Chen, who explained it was unlisted and given to him as compensation. Still skeptical, the manager couldn't believe someone would carry gold bars in a backpack. Jiang Chen emphatically placed a gold bar on the table and asked if the manager would make the deal or not. Cautioning against haste, the manager expressed concern about the lack of an invoice. Jiang Chen proposed a slightly lower price along with a personal tip for the manager. After some negotiation, the manager agreed, confirming the transaction through a bank transfer. Once the money was sent, the manager gave Jiang Chen his business card for future dealings, and Jiang Chen left in a taxi. Observing Jiang Chen's demeanor, the manager sensed he might possess more gold and contemplated whether to have someone follow our protagonist. He had dismissed the idea and decided to observe cautiously first. He reminded his employee to treat Jiang Chen as a VIP in the future. Feeling accomplished, Jiang Chen decided to show off his money proudly. The driver laughed at him for treating a rental car like a limousine ride. Jiang Chen arrived at his destination and handed a large bill to the driver, telling him to keep the change. The driver approved of Jiang Chen, and our protagonist decided to buy some clothes, believing that good clothes make a man. He chose luxurious brands and went to a store he was familiar with, planning to flaunt his wealth where he had recently worked. He intended to show off to the woman who had fired him. Since sales were not going well, he planned to buy the most expensive clothes. However, he sensed something was off and started browsing for clothes. A store employee noticed him casually selecting clothes from the precious section without looking at the price tags. She tried to help Jiang Chen by offering assistance. Jiang Chen then asked for his bill and requested the woman to provide him with a set of every piece of clothing in the store. The woman wondered if Jiang Chen was joking, but he insisted he wasn't. 
She realized that Zhang Chen must be a local young tycoon. While paying with his card, Zhang Chen looked around for the woman he was seeking to impress. He wondered where the manager had gone, hoping to see her reaction after he had been fired and slapped. As the woman packed his clothes, Zhang Chen asked about the manager's whereabouts. The woman had asserted that the manager went to the main office, questioning if Zhang Chen was dissatisfied with her service. Zhang Chen insisted that he was friends with the manager named Exida. The woman countered, stating that the manager's surname was Hedu, not Exia. But she did recall the last manager having the surname Xia. Zhang Chen then inquired about the previous manager's whereabouts. The woman explained that manager Xia got fired, and new employees took over the store. Zhang Chen, despite smirking and celebrating in the dressing room, suddenly felt a sense of emptiness upon realizing that manager Xia was fired shortly after him. He sighed, recognizing that he had been viewing his life unrealistically. Deciding to move on, he left behind his previous work, anticipating business in the near future. Emerging from the dressing room with a cool demeanor, Jiang Chen instructed the store employee to distribute the remaining clothes to street beggars. Subsequently, Jiang Chen headed to an upscale salon that required appointments. Despite attempts to dissuade him, he insisted on the most expensive service. Once seated, a beautiful woman attended to him, playing relaxing music before washing Jiang Chen's hair. He greatly experienced the luxurious experience, considering it money well spent. The hairdresser noticed Zhang Chen wearing expensive clothes and touched his body. It was her first time serving a wealthy man with a fit physique. Lost in her thoughts, she accidentally poured hot water on Zhang Chen, but quickly apologized and continued with the haircut. After the service, Zhang Chen paid with his card, completing his makeover. As he walked on the streets, he felt a sense of loneliness. Planning to contact old acquaintances, he spotted a female clothing store and debated buying something for Sun Zhou. However, he hesitated, considering it might be odd for a single man to enter such a store. He envisioned a normal, peaceful life with Sun Zhou, strolling the modern streets as a family. Jiang Chen's contemplative moment was interrupted by his growling stomach. He headed to a three-star Michelin restaurant and spent 10,000, although he couldn't finish everything. He paid the full amount with his card, Later, Jiang Chen went to the beach to relax and enjoy the sea breeze after a tiring day. Despite studying nearby, it was his first visit to the area. He had heard about the beautiful scenery and bikini-clad women, but was disappointed not to see any on the beach. His disappointment increased when he realized he had only spent 200,000 out of his 1 million. He couldn't believe he had become a wealthy person, the very thing he despised. While others might see his plan to buy a house with a million yuan, he still had a gold vault worth a billion. Contemplating whether to continue cashing out gold in banks, he considered its impact on gold prices. The idea of starting a company to sell holographic computer technology crossed his mind, anticipating billions in profit from mass production. Jiang Chen also considered virtual reality and relaxation pods, but releasing such advanced technology suddenly could attract unwanted attention. He decided to quietly amass wealth and accumulate initial capital. Suddenly, a woman in a bikini approached Jiang Chen, viewing him as rich and good-looking compared to her sugar daddy. Politely excusing himself, he advised her to preserve her youth for someone more meaningful. He even mentioned that Sun Zhao had a better figure, leaving the woman confused. Realizing he sounded peculiar, Jiang Chen decided to head home. Shifting focus, we turn to Xi Xiu, a Wanghai University graduate with looks and talents. Praised for graduating with outstanding results, she chose not to pursue graduate school due to family reasons. Opting to work as a manager for a clothing store, she brought success to the store she led. With her talent and strict management, she had boosted the sales of the clothing store to new heights. She even found a caring boyfriend who used to pick her up after work. However, she often responded coldly to him, and rumors suggested she might have had some personal issues. Se Xiu investigated the source of the rumors and ended up blaming Zhang Chen. She constantly targeted him over minor issues and eventually fired him. Jiang Chen decided to forget about it after a few drinks, while Xia Xiu continued working. However, her actions took a toll when she fired the store's most popular employee. Others couldn't tolerate her rigid and formal management style. The combination of low salaries and high standards affected employee performance, leading to a decline in sales. The once highly praised woman for her business skills found herself unemployed. Xia Xiu realized her mistakes as the respect she once received turned into resentment. Even her boyfriend broke up with her due to her distant personality, possibly exacerbated by her financial struggles. 
To make matters worse, she discovered that the car her ex-boyfriend used with other girls was under her name, and she had been providing him with money, some of which he pocketed. She only uncovered these issues after losing her job. Kesha Shiv felt disheartened when she saw another woman sitting in the passenger seat. She thought about calling the police, but dealing with these shady loan people wouldn't be helpful. So she decided to escape from her condominium and hide in a cheap rental house while working part-time to survive. As she started to enjoy her new job, her luck took a turn for the worse. Loan sharks showed up at the store where she worked. They confronted her about her loan, and despite the store owner's attempts to intervene, they insisted on talking to Kseshiu. Seeing the owner scared, Kseshiu decided to talk with them. The loan sharks were surprised to find someone like Kseshiu working in a flower shop and wondered if she had raised enough money. She assured them she would repay and asked them not to harass her. However, the loan sharks were impatient and demanded either the money or her body. Kseshiu couldn't believe they were involved in human trafficking. The loan shark laughed and dismissed her, claiming that someone as beautiful as her would be a waste. They had planned to force Kseshiu into selling her body before marrying her off. The loan shark insisted he understood her feelings, but rules were rules. He proposed she work at their affiliated club until she paid off her debt with interest, assuring her that she could then discreetly leave the city. A few minutes earlier, Zhang Chen had been walking home when he noticed people hastily fleeing from a certain area. Intrigued, he investigated and found a group of loan sharks gathered in front of a flower shop. It was then he spotted Xia Xiu. Without hesitation, he approached the loan sharks, offering them expensive cigarettes. Puzzled, they inquired about his identity. Claiming to know Xia Xiu, Jiang Chen questioned whether she owed them money. Xia Xiu, surprised by his sudden appearance, wondered why Jiang Chen was there. He further inquired about the amount she owed and criticized the loan sharks for ganging up on a single girl, deeming it unmanly. Despite the loan shark acknowledging the debt and stating the interest was still low, he persisted in wanting Xia Xiu to work at the club due to her beauty. The loan shark got angry and attempted to attack Jiang Chen. However, Jiang Chen thought the man's movements were slow. He didn't want trouble due to his advanced tech and expensive clothes. Instead of fighting, he peacefully suggested talking things out. The man then tried to stab Jiang Chen, but he easily took the knife away. The loan shark was surprised, and his men offered assistance. Zhang Chen asked for a timeout, pointing out the CCTV cameras recording them. The man questioned if Zhang Chen wanted to face danger where nobody could see. Despite this, Zhang Chen showed no fear. He assured Xia Xiu that he would return soon. Xia Xiu considered calling the police, while the store owner was grateful for someone sacrificing for Xia Xiu. In an alley, the loan sharks attempted another attack, but Zhang Chen mysteriously produced a gun. The man insisted it was fake. To prove otherwise, Jiang Chen shot one of the men behind him and asked again if it was fake. Jiang Chen had suggested retesting it, but the man insisted on talking things through. Jiang Chen claimed he had already requested that from the beginning, but the man considered him crazy. Jiang Chen asked for the loan slip and his account number. The man questioned Jiang's intentions, and Jiang explained that he wanted to buy the loan slip, criticizing the loan sharks for not thinking about it. After sending the money through a bank transfer, he dismissed the loan sharks and stored the loan slip in his dimensional storage. Meanwhile, Xia Xiu waited outside the flower shop for Zhang Chen's return. She checked on his condition, finding him unharmed except for a small cut. Xia Xiu offered to treat him at her place, looking flustered. Zhang Chen told her not to act that way since he was now her new creditor. Surprised by Zhang Chen's change, Xia Xiu wondered if he had gone crazy due to drugs. She swore to pay him back at the normal rate. While Jiang Chen teased her, the store owner approached Xia Xiu, gave her half a month's salary, and asked her to quit. Xia Xiu had tried to plead to keep her job, but the store owner had slammed the door on her. Jiang Chen then teased her, asking if the feeling of being fired was familiar. Finding herself unemployed once again, Xia Xiu sighed and attempted to leave. Annoyingly, Jiang Chen followed her, and the two argued along the way. They soon reached a rundown apartment, and Jiang Chen couldn't believe such places still existed in Wanhai. Upon discovering Xia Xiu's room, he remarked that it didn't suit a beautiful girl like her, reminiscing that he had been in a similar situation before. Nervous about inviting a man into her room, Xia Xiu told Jiang Chen to sit anywhere. Unfortunately, the chair he chose was busted. Xia Xiu returned with first aid to tend to Jiang Chen's small wound. As she took care of him, Jiang Chen became flustered, 
and Sesso Shiyu instructed him to stop moving. Jiang Chen claimed to smell a sweet fragrance, leading to an awkward silence between them. Se Xiu then expressed gratitude to Zhang Chen for saving her and wondered if he harbored any ill feelings towards her. Zhang Chen admitted he helped her without a specific reason, deciding to leave everything in the past. According to him, seeking revenge wouldn't bring any benefit and would only lead to guilt. He considered losing his job as a fortunate event, as it allowed him to acquire the interdimensional bracelet later on. Se Xiu then acknowledged feeling like an inadequate manager after letting Zhang Chen go. Jiang Chen agreed that she had the necessary skills for the job but lacked empathy towards others. Xia Xiu questioned if it was related to psychology studies, but Jiang Chen clarified that it wasn't something one could learn from books. The two continued talking until Jiang Chen noticed only women's shoes at Xia Xiu's doorstep. He wondered if her boyfriend would be upset about a guy visiting her. Xia Xiu couldn't say much, and Jiang Chen figured it out. He called Sita Xiu's ex-boyfriend trash, but she insisted he wasn't her boyfriend. Jiang Chen suggested going back to her parents' house, but she didn't want to cause trouble. Jiang Chen admired her attitude. Sita Xiu then wondered if Jiang Chen would listen to her story, but quickly dismissed the idea. Jiang Chen got curious, and Sita Xiu shared everything that happened after firing him from the store. He noticed she wasn't seeking empathy, just tired and wanting someone to talk to. Seeing her laugh, Jiang Chen suggested doing it more since she looked better. Sita Xiu told him to stop joking and asked Jiang Chen to share his story. Jiang Chen casually mentioned starting a small business and making some money, but Sita Xiu doubted him. Jiang Chen then said he needed a business manager and asked Sita Xiu to take the job. Jiang Chen thought this was his chance to start a business instead of exchanging gold for cash. He planned to out to other game companies and chose Xia Xiu because she was professional and reliable. Sita Xiu was puzzled when Jiang Chen suggested she work under him to pay back her debt. She hesitated, unsure about becoming his subordinate and skeptical about Jiang Chen's business ideas. Jiang Chen, excited about having his ex-supervisor work for him, eventually convinced Xia Xiu after some thought. He celebrated by offering her a starting salary of 20,000 yuan, surprising her. Xia Xi reminded him that she doesn't accept any hidden rules, to which Jiang Chen promised no office romance, making Xia Xi unexpectedly upset. Curious about the company's nature, Xia Xi began listing possible positions related to the technology sector. Jiang Chen interrupted her, declaring that she would be the CEO and handle everything. He envisioned her as the Bill Gates of China, leaving Xia Xi so bewildered that she jokingly called a mental hospital. Jiang Chen had managed to stop her and asked Xia Xiu to listen first. He reminded her about Jack Ma's successful business story. He mentioned that the company didn't have many businesses at the moment and suggested that she take on the role of a general manager. He offered a gradual salary increase and assured her there would be no pressure regarding the debt. Additionally, he planned to wire her half a million yuan to register the company, with the intention of getting busy in two months. Se Xiu sighed, wondering if Jiang Chen wasn't concerned that she might run away with the money. Jiang Chen, however, believed that Se Xiu was not that kind of person and considered half a million yuan a reasonable investment for him. She had been without a job and owed him money, but Se Xiu agreed to take the position. Jiang Chen was happy and asked for her account number to send her salary. He also suggested finding a safer place to live. He mentioned that she might not reach him for the next few days. Se Xiu complimented Jiang Chen for looking cool when he saved her and left, closing the door. Jiang Chen briefly wondered if she had developed feelings for him, but dismissed the thought, thinking it was her way of expressing gratitude. Se Xiu felt embarrassed about her comment. Later, Jiang Chen went on a vacation to Sanya in the southern part of Hainan. He explored the area and enjoyed the trip, emphasizing that life is short, and he decided to take vacations. While in a taxi, he reflected that his week-long trip had cost him a significant amount of money. He pondered whether he should consider buying an island next. Upon arriving at a five-star hotel, he checked into his room. Jiang Chen enjoyed his room's private pool, observing the lovely girls in the pool below. He pondered on how to spend more of his money. Later, he changed his clothes and reclined by the poolside. He continued to watch women from various backgrounds while sipping on a 1982 wine. However, finding the sour taste unpleasant, he left. Returning to his room, he finally grasped the feelings of the wealthy depicted in movies when they visited the beach. Suddenly feeling hungry, he donned a suit to enhance his appearance. 
At that moment, an invitation arrived at his door. It turned out that the prince of Saudi Arabia was hosting a banquet for his beloved princess. Jiang Chen soon enjoyed some delicious, high-class ribs. After devouring them in somewhat uncivilized, he planned to sample the barbecue next. Jiang Chen had noticed the prince of Saudi Arabia and his beautiful wife. Their conversation didn't interest him much, but his genetic mutation allowed him to overhear them. The prince decided to celebrate this year in the Far East. The discussion then shifted to wealthy individuals getting involved with famous celebrities. Jiang Chen found it hard to believe and worried about the possibility of a sneaky reporter. Suddenly, a bearded man named Bruce Miller approached Jiang Chen, introducing himself after observing him enjoying the expensive meat. Jiang Chen was impressed that Bruce knew Mandarin and wondered how he identified him as Chinese. Bruce claimed it was due to his keen eyes but actually noticed it from the way Jiang Chen ate. While scanning Bruce, Jiang Chen spotted a gun peeking out of his suit. Bruce reassured him, raising his hands and explaining that he felt a sense of camaraderie with someone in the same profession. Jiang Chen played along, acting as if they were in the same field. Bruce questioned whether Jiang Chen wasn't concerned about the security watching over him. Jiang Chen replied that he didn't care since he was on vacation, casually greeting the bodyguards from a distance. Bruce sighed at the eyesore of security in the banquet, but acknowledged that he would lose in close combat against Jiang Chen. He decided to leave, instructing his men to stand down and personally keeping an eye on Jiang Chen. Jiang Chen was surprised to see Bruce back. Bruce made up an excuse that he felt like they clicked, but he just wanted to observe a dangerous man. Jiang Chen knew what was up. Bruce then started talking about his teens and the banquet continued. We then see Bruce totally drunk and continued telling Jiang Chen about his mission in Ukraine. He then finished his story, then asked about Jiang Chen. He wondered why Jiang Chen was spending a lot in a beachside villa. Jiang Chen claimed he should enjoy spending his money, not to buy his coffin. Bruce apologized since he was curious about Jiang Chen's business, but Jiang Chen casually confessed that it was related to gold. Bruce assumed it was from South Africa, but Jiang Chen claimed it was from Asia, making Bruce confused since there were no hot spots anywhere in Asia. Jiang Chen then decided to make up an excuse since it was getting bothersome. Bruce just nodded and cheered again for their new friendship. The banquet was over and everyone was gone except for Jiang Chen. He got Bruce's name card and wondered why would he contact him. He then tried to forget about it. Just then, a green-haired woman approached him. The woman found Jiang Chen attractive and claimed she just wanted someone to accompany her to the beach. Jiang Chen claimed it was a coincidence since he wanted a companion back to his villa. The woman named Liu Yao offered her hand and claimed that she was an actress. What happens next is up to your imagination. The next morning, we see Liu Yao sleeping soundly on a bed. Jiang Chen savored the sea breeze on the balcony, discovering that his stats had increased thanks to the genetic medication. To further boost them, he needed either physical training or a higher grade of medication. He found himself pondering how Sun Zhao and Yao Yao were faring. Later, Jiang Chen enjoyed some morning wine outdoors until Liu Yao joined him. She cautioned him about the ill effects of morning wine on the stomach. Ignoring her advice, he pulled her close, urging her to appreciate the scenery with him. Liu Yao questioned whether he was admiring the view or her, and Jiang Chen casually asserted that it was both. In a moment of reflection, Jiang Chen wondered why Liu Yao hadn't achieved greater success despite her beauty and intelligence. Liu Yao, feeling a sudden sadness, claimed that being beautiful was sometimes considered a crime. Jiang Chen chuckled at her response, teasing her for taking his compliment seriously. Returning to their room, Jiang Chen pondered what Liu Yao was up to. She snapped a photo to show off her stay in an expensive seaside villa. Concerned about potential scandals, Jiang Chen warned her, but Liu Yao saw it as an opportunity to gain more fame. Despite his worries, she expressed her intention to revel in the beauty of life. As she went back outside, Jiang Chen realized he might be taken advantage of. Liu Yao then seduced him, making Jiang Chen angry as he had just put on some nice clothes. In response, he punished the actress. Shortly afterward, Jiang Chen received a notification that someone was at the villa's doorstep, and it turned out to be Bruce. Liu Yao wondered if she should hide, and Jiang Chen suggested she take the opportunity to grab her luggage and move into his place. Liu Yao left accordingly. Jiang Chen couldn't figure out why the head of the prince's security, Bruce, had come to find him. Bruce explained that one of his clients had overheard them and became interested in Jiang Chen. Assuming it was related to mercenary work, Jiang Chen initially tried to refuse, 
but Bruce insisted it was connected to his gold business. Reluctantly, Jiang Chen agreed to meet the other person. Ten minutes later, a bald man informed his boss that Jiang Chen had arrived. The man, named Robert Smith, introduced himself. Jiang Chen was surprised that Robert could speak Chinese and praised him for it. Robert expressed his long-standing interest in doing business in the mysterious East and introduced his personal bodyguard, Nick. Curious, Jiang Chen inquired if Robert dealt with dangerous situations. Considering his involvement in crude oil and gold, Robert admitted to handling firearms as well and lamented the strict laws regarding them in Jiang Chen's country. Robert had wondered if Jiang Chen needed assistance with his business. He asked Jiang Chen not to misunderstand, clarifying that his intention was solely to start a business relationship with the mysterious East Country. Recalling China's strict regulations on gold, Jiang Chen noted that America had similar regulations. Roberts agreed and shared an example of how he dealt with crude oil from the Middle East for assurance. Intrigued, Jiang Chen listened as Robert explained that he could circulate Jiang Chen's gold through his mining company in South Africa, taking only a 9% fee. Concerned that the fee might be too high, Robert feared Jiang Chen's refusal. However, Jiang Chen agreed to the deal with a condition. He insisted on the highest purity of gold and wanted Robert to handle the transport, accepting payment in US dollars on the spot. Robert chuckled, accepting the conditions and sealing the deal with Jiang Chen. He handed Jiang Chen his business card and suggested opening a Swiss bank account. As Jiang Chen left, Robert pondered how much gold he would bring and prepared for the capital needed. Jiang Chen mentioned it would be mid-July, and he planned to bring at least a few tons. Genuinely shocked, Robert realized he would make $10 million from the fee alone. Curious about Jiang Chen's trustworthiness, Robert asked Nick for his opinion. Nick apologized, stating he didn't know but emphasized that Jiang Chen was a dangerous man. Robert had wondered if it was about Chinese Kung Fu. Nick's instincts told him that he would win in a gunfight, but it would be different in close combat. Meanwhile, Jiang Chen celebrated outside as he had finally found a way to get rid of his vault of gold. Initially, he had planned to sell the gold bit by bit to different shops, but now he could get billions in one go, thanks to his new friend Robert. Shortly after, he arrived at the villa's entrance where a hungry Liu Yao had been waiting for him. Jiang Chen then took her to a nearby ice field ocean restaurant. Liu Yao noticed a cute penguin, but Jiang Chen claimed she was cuter. He also found the scenery great. Liu Yao wondered if something had happened since Jiang Chen looked very happy. Jiang Chen claimed he had just struck a very good deal. Liu Yao thought it was because of her. Jiang Chen let Liu Yao guess how much he got. Liu Yao wondered if it was a million dollars, and Jiang Chen claimed they were just a fraction of a billion dollars. Liu Yao was shocked that Jiang Chen had it in him. Jiang Chen then reminded her that it was him who was inside her the other night. For the next five days, Jiang Chen enjoyed his vacation with Liu Yao, but Brother Chicken was on the verge of fainting already. After those days, Jiang Chen flew back home, wondering if he would meet Liu Yao again. Jiang Chen returned home to find an upset Exia Xiu, who had unsuccessfully tried to reach him. Surprised that he, as the company owner, wasn't addressing the situation, she reminded him of their pending visit to the Commerce Bureau. Jiang Chen expressed gratitude for her hard work and treated her to a meal. Xia Xiu, without checking the menu, confidently ordered the most expensive items. To her surprise, Jiang Chen didn't seem bothered. As they waited for the food, Xia Xiu expressed concerns about the company's future and questioned Jiang Chen's grasp of advanced tech and math. Jiang Chen admitted his weakness in those areas and proposed focusing on innovation in game development and the smartphone market. Interrupting him, Xia Xiu suggested starting with mobile gaming before entering the phone market. Jiang Chen agreed, citing her 10% ownership of the company, a fact she was unaware of. As they discussed shares, Xia Xiu found it strange since the company hadn't fully taken shape yet. After the meal, Jiang Chen, satisfied, returned home and felt things were settling. Planning to go out, he ordered food and essentials, reminiscing about buying women's clothing a while ago. In the apocalyptic world in Leading Town, a team of mercenaries entered an area with Wang Shiwu leading the team. A life detection tool was used and someone verified their target's presence. A green-haired man confirmed it by sight and asked for permission to attack. Wang told him to stand by and wondered what was hiding in the target building. He then reported back to HQ and asked for artillery support. The support confirmed the request and claimed that the shot will reach in a minute. Ammunition was loaded and fired toward the target. 
Juan watched as the building exploded and tried to confirm that it was destroyed. However, they were shot down with something. The support wondered what was happening and Wang reported they were going down. They bailed out of the chopper and ordered his team to focus on their objective. They then activated their jet boosters. Wang's team safely landed and discovered the entity that had fired at them. The team's science enthusiasts rejoiced, believing they hit the jackpot when they found a high-energy crystal reading from the object in front of them. Wang asked him to figure out how to retrieve the crystal, but another team member cautioned them about the danger associated with the high-energy reading. One questioned whether they should fear a 200-kilogram sluggish creature, describing it as a lump of mutated zombies essentially disabled. He asserted that the shot they heard earlier was a one-time use. The science enthusiast grew suspicious, mentioning that extreme mutants should attract scavengers, but they saw enough signs of mutant rats nearby. Suddenly, the ground shook, and the massive mutant began charging another attack, but there was nothing above it anymore. In a desperate move, Juan ordered his team to open fire to prevent the mutant from launching its attack, fearing the consequences. Ultimately, the mutant self-destructed, and everything in its vicinity was incinerated. Supporting staff confirmed that Wang's team had gone offline, and the crystal reading indicated that the target had split into 12 life forms. The support captain expressed disappointment at the 220,000 crystals used for the operation. Meanwhile, Jiang Chen returned to the apocalyptic world with a caged rat. He realized that living things couldn't be brought during interdimensional travel. He stumbled upon an unfamiliar reinforced wall and wondered if it was the same place he had left a month ago. Sun Zhao had rushed out, embracing Jiang Chen with joy at his return. Wondering if she missed him as much as he missed her, Jiang Chen noticed Sun Zhao becoming suspicious as she sniffed something on him. She then eagerly showed him the improvements made to the mansion during his absence, which had turned into a fortress for added safety. Agreeing with Sun Zhao's reasoning that their home needed to be secure, Jiang Chen set out to find Yao Yao. He discovered her peacefully sleeping in her untidy room. Inside, he came across her notebook, but unable to comprehend its contents, he realized that Yao Yao must have fallen asleep while reading. When he picked up the book, Yao Yao stirred, sleep-talking briefly before settling back down. Choosing to let her rest, Jiang Chen acknowledged her efforts and gave her more time to sleep. Seeing the books scattered, Jiang Chen assumed that the girls had gone to infested areas to get them. As he tried to think about starting to work, Jiang Chen noticed Sun Zhao wearing a surprising set of clothes. She told him to come down. Jiang Chen complimented her look, and Sun Zhao wondered if he had something more to say. Jiang Chen then suggested having a normal family meeting, but Sun Zhao aggressively stripped Jiang Chen and tied him down on a chair. She called him a cheater. Jiang Chen got scared, and Sun Zhao asserted that she would show how amazing she was. As the two got closer, Yao Yao suddenly shouted in shock. They totally forgot that she was also in the house. Sun Zhao then tried to act cool and told Yao Yao to handle the intruder she captured. Jiang Chen then exclaimed that it was him, and Yao Yao was happy to see him and proceeded to remove the ropes. The three finally had a normal family meeting, and Jiang confessed something. He admitted that he came from a different world, but Sun Zhao had already figured it out from her assumptions. Seeing Yao Yao's confusion, Jiang Chen displayed his ability to retrieve things from his dimensional storage, leaving the girls impressed. Yao Yao began to wonder if Jiang Chen might be a god. However, he clarified that it was just a storage space he could use between worlds and explained how he used gold from his world to buy food and necessities. This confirmed that Jiang Chen hailed from a peaceful world. Yao Yao then speculated that someone else might be able to travel with him, but Jiang Chen revealed a caged mouse dispelling that idea. Concerned, Yao Yao thought the mouse might have died due to the bacteria in the apocalyptic world's air. Jiang Chen, realizing the oversight of potential infections during his travels, thanked his bracelet for preventing the spread in his world. He brought out a lot of food, and Sun Jiao suggested exchanging them for crystals in nearby survivor camps. However, Jiang Chen, lacking trust in them, preferred heading to the sixth block. Sun Jiao mentioned possible mercenaries waiting there but Jiang Chen assured them and suddenly disappeared. A minute later, he returned in pain, explaining that traveling between worlds took a toll on his body. Despite this, he suggested going to the sixth block as they were and obtaining items once they arrived. He also proposed gathering more people, leading Sun Jiao to wonder if Jiang Chen was interested in recruiting more beautiful girls. Jiang Chen had expressed the need for specialists to guard their vast villa. Yao Yao had questioned her own usefulness, but Jiang Chen reassured her that she indeed served a purpose. 
Sun Zhou then cautioned Zhang Chen against removing any slate collars, except for Yao Yao's, and he agreed. Although Sun Zhao wondered if the family meeting was over, Zhang Chen still awaited something from her. Sun Zhao, pleased that Zhang Chen remembered, admitted that the mansion was her home. In a flashback, we witnessed Sun Zhao being captured by bandits who had sinister plans for her. They intended to either sell her to human traffickers or use her as zombie bait. Facing imminent death, Sun Zhao suddenly found herself rescued when the bandits were shot and thrown into panic. As they tried to retaliate, the sniper revealed their presence, taunting the bandits as mere novices, and swiftly eliminated one of them. The woman swiftly moved to slash the bandits' throats one by one. Some tried to resist, but she easily overpowered them. As the murders continued, Sun Zhou hid somewhere, trembling in fear. The woman eventually found her and encouraged her to come out. Upon learning that Sun Zhou was a refugee from Area 071, the woman asked her to join. Sun Zhao noticed the bandits were all eliminated, and the woman explained that she had been tracking them for days. She assured Sun Zhou that the outside world was different from Area 071 and asked when was the last time she had eaten. As they walked, Sun Zhao ate the bread given to her. The woman introduced herself as Pla, a wasteland cleaner, or, in another sense, a murderer. Pla inquired about Sun Zhou's plans, but the little girl couldn't speak. Assuming she was mute, Pla decided to take Sun Zhao to the sixth block. However, Sun Zhao disagreed. Pla wondered where Sun Zhao wanted to go, and the girl claimed she wanted to find her family. Pla called her lucky and reminded her to quickly learn more about the world. Zhang Chen had wondered what had happened next. Sun Zhao then said her master had been lying all along. Finding a family in the wasteland was impossible now. Sun Zhao considered herself fortunate to have met her master, which made her stronger. However, she suddenly disappeared, and rumors circulated that she had died in a battle. Sun Zhao then wandered alone until she confirmed the demise of her family. She had not heard about her sister's fate, so she searched for her until she reached the shelter where her father had lived in the past. Sun Zhao aimlessly roamed until she changed into some new clothes. Exhausted and malnourished, she fainted. She thought a ghost had appeared, but it was Zhang Chen. He promised to look for her sister and wondered if there was anything he could do for Yao Yao. Yao Yao didn't ask for anything more, she was already content with her new family. Zhang Chen then recalled something and took out a smartphone from his dimensional storage. Sun Zhao told them to handle their tasks while she managed the supplies. The two went into Yao Yao's room and Zhang Chen couldn't believe the room had transformed into a mad scientist's lab. Yao Yao expressed her desire to explore the high technology of Zhang Chen's world. He cautioned her not to expect too much, as it was only mobile games on the smartphone. Yao Yao was unfamiliar with the terms, and Zhang Chen took the time to explain. After some explanations, Yao Yao grasped the concept of Zhang Chen's world of gaming, which differed from their world's pre-war gaming capsules. She then explained how to use these devices, and Zhang Chen realized it was somewhat like VR games. He instructed Yao Yao to investigate his phone, and she was shocked at how outdated its processor and storage were. After disassembling the phone, she expressed concern about dealing with some of its content. Zhang Chen wondered if he had set his expectations too high, but Yao Yao assured him to leave things to her within five days. She explained that she could gather information from a nearby library recently explored by Sun Zhao. Happy with the prospect, Jiang Chen praised Yao Yao and left her room. He found Sun Zhao, who had just finished packing new supplies. Despite Jiang Chen's attempts at flirting, Sun Zhao got upset as he hadn't assisted her. Jiang Chen, unaware of her urgency, promised not to let her go hungry. Flustered, Sun Zhao changed the subject, reminding Jiang Chen about the gold she had recently collected. However, Jiang Chen wanted to get back at her for what she had done to him. He locked the basement and the outcome of what happened next is left to your imagination. Shortly afterward, we saw Zhang Chen attempting to snipe zombies but consistently missing his shots. He aimed for the heads but kept hitting the chests. Then he tried aiming a bit higher and finally hit a zombie's head. Sun Zhao praised him and suggested fixing his aim and position while also reminding him to mind the target's distance and reload, especially in situations with zombie hordes. Zhang Chen thought things would be easy now that he had improved his body. Jiang Chen continued practicing until the zombies started acting aggressively since it was sundown. Seeing Jiang Chen's progress, Sun Zhao claimed he'd have passed, and going against the six block bandits should be easy. Jiang Chen wondered if he could really do it. The next morning, Jiang Chen finished his preparations to go alone to the six block. 
Yao Yao noticed him and told him to wait as she went back to her room. Jiang Chen informed her that he was heading to a dangerous place, but Sun Zhao reassured him. Yao Yao then returned with a mini drone she had designed and went back to sleep. Jiang Chen swore to return for sure. Five hours later, Jiang Chen arrived in an area near the sixth block. Since the path looked safe, he put on his hood and lined up at the entrance. He safely entered the gates and went to meet a man who rented containers. The man had a lousy attitude as he explained the rental details and led Jiang Chen to his assigned container. After receiving the key to his container, Jiang Chen entered and retrieved supplies he brought from his world, such as canned food and compressed biscuits. After locking the container, Jiang Chen's next destination was the inner ring, where he hoped to find someone trustworthy for transactions. Just then, he noticed a machine passing by and wondered if it had been a weapon. Jiang Chen was stopped by a mercenary who asked for an entrance fee. Things appeared different inside, and Jiang Chen came across a hotel. Entering, he met a man with green hair and requested a premium room for a week. Of course, he paid the full amount in advance. Meanwhile, a man checked Jiang Chen's records and found him intriguing due to his background in food production. His secretary wondered if the man wanted to meet Jiang Chen, but he advised her not to hurry. The secretary then asked if he preferred curry for lunch, and the man silently nodded. Lunch was served, and the man relished the aroma and flavor of the chicken curry. The secretary felt a twinge of envy. After finishing his meal, the man reminisced about how canned foods had started appearing a few days ago. Leveraging his position, he managed to obtain some, though he regretted being limited to just one canned item per day. As he perused Jiang Chen's record, he pondered why the man seemed familiar. On the other hand, in a hotel room, a capsule opened, and Jiang Chen emerged, looking satisfied. He marveled at the capsule's massage function, which enhanced his physical well-being. Testing his abilities against a ping-pong robot, he was ultimately defeated. Later, he stumbled upon a remote control that could alter the room's appearance. He was amazed when he experienced the virtual environment, finding it so lifelike. He explored the Industrial Revolution and World War II, and the 7D movie and health capsule left him in awe. The servant robots impressed him with their beauty. However, his excitement took a hit when, despite choosing the Perseus hotel room, he couldn't catch any fish. Just as he pondered initiating some entertainment, the doorbell rang. Jiang Chen hurriedly leaped off his sofa to change his clothes. The person from earlier showed up and introduced himself as Zhao Chenmu. Apologizing for the unexpected visit, Zhao Chenmu was taken aback by the sight of oranges in a jar. He, along with his secretary Su Lei, fell silent, clearly not having seen real fruits for a long time. Zhang Chen sensed their seriousness and guessed that Zhao Chenwu had already investigated him, realizing that Jiang Chen deliberately shared the hotel information to attract attention. Wanting to lighten the mood, Jiang Chen urged them to put aside serious talk and offered fresh fruits brought in by the robot maid. The two were stunned, and Jiang Chen insisted it was prepared especially for them. Zhao Chen was hand trembled as he took a bite, feeling refreshed and regaining composure. He praised the deliciousness but expressed disappointment that Sixth Block couldn't produce similar quality. He talked about how challenging it was to grow such plants due to radiation, and only a small amount is safe to eat. Later he assumed that the canned goods appearing in the exchange house were from Jiang Chen. When questioned, our main character pretended not to know. Witnessing Jiang Chen's arrogance, Zhao Chen Wu introduced himself as a businessman. Jiang Chen then mentioned the prices of the canned goods in the exchange house and Zhou Chen was suggested selling them in the inner ring next time. Zhang Chen claimed it wouldn't be a one-time deal. Formally introducing himself as a member of the committee and the president of the Zhou group, Zhao Chen Wu welcomed Zhang Chen's food company to the sixth block. Zhang Chen, pleased with catching a big opportunity, revealed himself as a representative of Fishbone Food Company and expressed interest in trading in the block. This surprised Zhao Chen Wu, who wondered where Zhang Chen's stable food source came from. Zhang Chen played it down, suggesting a discussion. Zhao Chen Wu mistakenly thought Zhang Cheng was just a reseller. Afterward, Zhang Chen experimented with some firearms. These weapons were made in Zhu Chen Wu's district. Zhang Chen then requested more rifles and grenades. Su Lei came in with a contract. In return for food, Zhang Chen would receive firearms. Zhao Chen Wu questioned if Zhang Chen's company lacked proper weaponry and recommended staying in the sixth block instead. Politely, Jiang Chen dismissed the idea, stating he was only a representative. Su Lei then asked Jiang Chen to verify the business registration 
and they pledged assistance with population issues and firearms. Later on, Zhao Chenwu proposed visiting his arms factory, and their platform ascended. Jiang Chen could see that the place wasn't created on a whim. Zhao Chenwu proceeded to introduce his factory. Jiang Chen felt surprised when he saw drones capable of carrying heavy loads for everyday use, but also adaptable for search and destroy missions. Zhao Chen Wu then urged Zhang Chen to check something out, and they put on sunglasses. He explained that the site was for testing weapons. Zhang Chen was impressed by the array of weapons, and Zhao Chen Wu mentioned it would take two months to provide them due to checkpoints. The tour continued, showcasing reconnaissance robots and artillery spider tanks. Zhang Chen realized that humanity had developed these weapons for defense, wondering about the strength of the monsters that made survival so challenging for humans. At that moment, Zhao Chenwu offered nitrogen armor as a gift, assuming Zhang Chen came from a peaceful place. He explained its functionality and demonstrated it. Shots were fired at close range, and a shield appeared to protect the demonstrator. The armor's energy could withstand four machine gun attacks. Zhang Chen was satisfied and praised their weaponry. Zhao Chenwu mentioned that sales were low due to a scarcity of crystals and suggested moving on to their next destination. Meanwhile, an elderly man, formerly a mechanical engineer, woke up from a capsule with his wife. Unfortunately, the refugee camp was raided by bandits, and they were taken away to be sold as goods. Some of them had turned to a life of banditry after proving their worth, but most had become commodities. They were taken to the sixth block and labeled as laborers. They worked until the arrival of the man's wife in the sixth block. They were fortunate to reunite, but their joy was short-lived when they discovered the man was slated for shipment. They were marked as infected by the X1 virus. Initially thinking they might be used as a private army, the old man realized his wife was also among those to be transported. As they were loaded onto the truck, they could only await their unknown fate. Other families were present in the truck, and some members displayed skills in high-tech, which was now deemed useless after the war. The truck eventually halted, and Jiang Chen welcomed them with freshly cooked food. Those who had been shipped out couldn't believe they were smelling the aroma of rice once again. Jiang Chen invited them to eat, but confusion and doubt lingered, with some suspecting they were being lured into human experimentation. Nevertheless, the enticing smell of the food overcame their skepticism, and they all ate eagerly. Jiang Chen assured them they could have seconds and reminded them not to waste the delicious food, as he didn't want to see it go to waste. Shortly afterward, Sun Jiao exclaimed about how they had used a lot of resources to feed the newcomers. Jiang Chen assured her that he could acquire more if needed. However, his budgeting wife couldn't help but get upset. Jiang Chen then visited the new arrivals, but they were all wary of him. To encourage them to answer his questions, he offered them the next day's meal as a reward. The only person who responded was the old engineer. Jiang Chen was pleased that they were fed and promised to help them achieve wealth beyond their wildest dreams. He just wanted them to prove their worth and in return, he would provide three meals a day. Later, Jiang Chen returned to his home world feeling completely exhausted. Despite having more tasks ahead, he was satisfied that their base was expanding well. Dealing with Zhao Chenwu had been a significant success. When he counted the gold bars, a neighbor got angry at the noise. Suddenly, he received a call with complaints from the homeowner pouring out of the speaker. Realizing it was time to leave, Jiang Chen mocked the homeowner and dropped the call since he wanted to call one of his girls. He then called Xia Xiu, who answered angrily, wondering why the missing chairman was calling her. She complained why would Jiang Chen turn off his phone, reminding him that their company is just starting. Jiang Chen had more things to do and casually invited Xia Xiu to look for a house together. Xia Xiu dropped the call but Jiang Chen called again. She tried to calm down herself and asked Jiang Chen what does buying a house do with her. Jiang Chen claimed he just wanted to hang out and assured her that the game being developed is nearly settled. He swore to find specialists next in some places like a job fair. Xia Xiu then agreed since she was obligated to prevent her boss to play hooky and drop the call. He was glad he got her on board since Xia Xiu was great with words. Jiang Chen then wondered what to do with his gold bars and suddenly remembered Robert. He tried calling, but no one was answering until a different voice asked how he was. Jiang Chen introduced himself and Nick responded, claiming that his boss was in trouble. He wondered if Jiang Chen could help and Nick told him everything. Jiang Chen found out that they were attacked by terrorists. He thought of finding another way of cashing out the gold bars he had but it was still risky. Just then, he got his passport ready and some weapons. He then decided to prepare a few sum and contacted the manager from the gold shop. 
The next day, Jiang Chen successfully cashed out a few gold bars and thanked the manager for the great business. After seeing Jiang Chen leave, the manager called for someone and marked Jiang Chen as a target. A man named In Shan had received the manager's request. He assured the manager that he wouldn't trouble the gold shop or the manager anymore. The manager smirked, thinking that Jiang Chen was finished. Meanwhile, Robert found himself held captive by terrorists. Despite being given food, he refused to eat. Three days ago, his informant had betrayed him, leading to the capture. Other hostages had been murdered as they were considered worthless. While Robert was experienced in dealing with kidnappings and not particularly scared, this time was different. He had angered some higher powers, and he felt guilty for dragging Nick into this situation. While they were hiding from gunfire, someone suddenly pulled Robert away, leaving Nick to face the terrorist group alone. However, Jiang Chen had a gut feeling that Robert would soon be safe. Jiang Chen eventually arrived at a location, hailed a taxi, and learned from the driver that the war was still ongoing. Upon reaching his destination where Nick awaited, Nick noticed Jiang Chen was alone and questioned if he was enough reinforcement. Jiang Chen inquired about Robert's whereabouts, and Nick confirmed he knew after witnessing a reporter murdered live on media. Nick offered a gun, but Jiang Chen was already prepared. Together, they reached the area near the terrorist's stronghold, and Nick instructed Jiang Chen to get ready for battle.